Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's um, there's uh, there's a principle called Occam's razor, right? That the simplest explanation tends to be the the, the simplest idea or simplest explanation tends to be the correct one. We spend many, many years working in the big AAA studios, you know, very popular AAA studios, doing some awesome games and yeah, having an awesome experience while doing it. And then, you know, we started chatting about this possibility of one day maybe doing something of our own. But we needed an exit plan. And ever since we said that sentence out loud, we thought, oh, so funny, exit plan, yeah, well, why not? Exit plan. And then when it came the time to come up with a, a name for our, for our studio, which is arguably one of the most difficult things ever to come up with names. It's just the, the toughest task you can possibly think of. We kept coming back to that exit plan and uh, there you go. Yeah, so, uh, so to understand the connection to, to the meme of the country balls, which we all love, by the way, we need to go back and look at how this whole thing started. So at the beginning, it was just myself and Damien. Damien as a games designer, me as a visual effects artist. I have a little bit of experience with doing some other 3D things, but mostly visual effects. So we, from the very get-go, there are essentially two ways when you start a studio and you want to make a project, there are two ways to go at it. Either you already have this grand idea that you want an accomplishment and you want to find the people for it and you want to find the, the investment for it or whatever it is that it takes to get to this idea. Or there's this other approach, which uh, there's kind of an expression for this, which is like, uh, first who, then what? So this is the approach that we took. We look at what we had, so like the team that we had at the time, it was just the two of us. And then the, the question was, which I, was, was a question that Damien made at the time, which I thought was great, was like, all right, so if it's only the two of us, if it happened to be only the two of us, what game would we be able to make? And that immediately eliminated a lot of possibilities. We're not going to make a, a story-driven, like non-linear quest, open-world RPG or something like. We're not going to have a very kind of like very intense character development game and so on. It's going to be extremely gameplay-driven, and it's going to have a lot of VFX. So we started playing with a couple of prototypes, uh, things like uh, like for some first-person puzzle games. Uh, like The Witness or something, but with yeah, a few yeah, like yeah. Uh, humor elements like Portal. I mean, again, it's some of our favorite games. Mm -hmm. And one of our prototypes that we made that we started to have most fun with was a prototype kind of mildly based on the game called Katamari, which is a very popular game from a while back. Uh, very simple premise. You roll around on a ball, things stick to the ball, you get bigger, you stick bigger things to the ball, you just keep getting bigger and, and smaller and so on. And so that's exactly what we did. But then, slowly over time, we started expanding a little bit on, this, on these gameplay mechanics and thinking, so what if the ball moves and jumps a little bit like a third-person um, platformer would, like a, a Mario or something like this? What if it would jump and smash and dash? So we, had, so we suddenly had a little ball that had a little bit more than just very basic movie. It actually was able to jump, so we added a platformer element to the game. And we kept just going deeper and deeper with these layers of gameplay mechanics until the game was already something entirely different. Mm -hmm. Then we needed to wrap it up in a, uh, a context, give it a context. Damien, being a very big history buff, he, he, we thought of doing like historical events, like what if, what if the levels of the game are uh, periods of time in history, cool things that could be somehow turned into a, an explorable world with uh, with an objective to fulfill and places to explore and secrets to uncover, some cool items, some cool rewards. And ever so slowly, we started approaching what eventually became uh, the, the country ball meme. What, what is the country ball meme? We thought to ourselves, actually, this uh, fits just right, the, the type of things. Well, of course, we need, I know that there's a series of, you know, the, the, the hardcore country ball fans will surely notice that there's a series of mistakes that we're making, that the Poland ball should be upside down, and there are other balls which are not balls, there are other characters which are other shapes, but we needed to, uh, we needed to stick to a certain uh, set of rules. And so for that, we needed to keep the, the, the flags as it is, and the balls being, and all the countries being spherical in shape. Yeah, at the end of the day, we're not making Poland ball the meme, the game. It's, you know, it's bang on balls, and 
yeah, there are elements that are injected from, from the meme, but ultimately it's, it's a totally different beast. Um, and we have a lot of fun making it. Yeah. And the, and the most important thing for us is that people who are completely unaware of the meme can still have fun. Because yeah. that was extremely important for us to not be attached to the meme to that point mm -hmm. where if you're not aware of it, then you can't understand what's going on. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> I remember it because we'd spent <clears throat> a week writing all sorts of names on the board down there at the back and nothing worked. Basically, if somebody came up with an idea, turned around, maybe you'd get one person saying, yeah, I like it. And the rest were like, I'm not feeling it. You know, it's not, it's giving the wrong vibes. And then one evening we really had to come up with something because eventually you do need a proper name. And we sat down and Jose brought up the Thethoris. Th 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 the Thethoris. The and uh, he said, okay, so what's cool about our game? And I said, it's just, Good, it's just a good game. I like it. It's good. And he goes, okay, good. And then the thing came up with a very British <laughs> word, which is bang on. It's bang on. And I said, bang on balls. And instantly it clicked. Everyone was like, yeah, that's, that's stupid. I like it. So bang on balls. Also, it's Bob. So it makes it easier and for Bob, all the folders yes. and everything. So and it bang. applies very, very accurately to what you do in the game. Well, yeah, of course, because you bang all the balls as well. So it, as soon as soon as we said it, it just clicked. Right. And then yeah. Chronicles, because we felt like he needed like something that was ground to compensate with the silliness of the name. It was like Chronicles. And there you go. And we really liked it. And then we decided to sleep on it. And the next day we woke up and everybody agreed. We liked the name. Let's go with it. Jose is in our team. Damon is in our team. Uh, we managed to get some awesome talent uh, who really liked the game that we were doing and were uh, kind enough to join us on this trip of ours. We managed to get a good friend of ours from uh, CD Projekt who is a gameplay programmer called Wojtek Zedek and some really awesome talented artists uh, that are called uh, Rafał Pyrre and Tomek Andrzejewski who are level artists. Tomasz Pruski who is a level designer and more recently, we've been able to get our very first quality assurance, who is Krzysztof Gałążka, Krzysztof Gałążka, or as we call him, Little Branch. Little Branch, because so of the family name, yeah. Exactly. We also managed to have a rather exceptional uh, AI programmer who works from us, in, uh, as, um, he works from far away because he lives in the south of Poland, but he works with us full time, who is uh, Grzegorz Szef Szefczyk. Szefczyk? We call him G-Man, so it's easier yes. for everyone so to say his name, everyone. especially me. Exactly, and he makes the ball. G-Man is awesome. He's really good. We're, he's managed to, to really uh, bring the simple, simple balls with, to be actually very clever little balls that can navigate the world uh, really, really well, considering they have no legs. Katamari is definitely a big one, although really now there are no elements from it other than destruction maybe and a ball growing, but there's a lot of um, Mario 64 vibes in the game. Definitely heavily, it's more than vibes. I mean, you jump through, in, in Mario 64, you jump through paintings to enter the, uh, the worlds, and with us, you jump through uh, TV screens. Um, but there are many things as well. It's, it's more about the, the vibe of the game and how relax it is. I know our game does push towards destruction and, and um, just fast banging around, mashing the enemy, but ultimately it does share some, some elements that make me feel the same as when I played uh, Mario 64. Mm. I don't know. Can you think of any that would influence you visually? Yeah, maybe? well, I mean, I'm uh, I love Mario, and I 100% I agree with the influence of Mario 64. I personally love the original few Sonic the Hedgehog games mm. because um, I mean, again, we worked on very big AAA, come very complex AAA games, and games are getting extremely complicated technically, visually, and it's great. I love it. I, I, I'm always immensely impressed by what's achievable this uh, nowadays. But sometimes I'm, I don't know. It, it kind of makes me look back at these games from the 90s, let's say, 
that they were so simple. It was just a very simple premise. They didn't really explain mm. why the bad guy was bad. It was just, it was the bad guy. He was just, uh, you know, and Sonic the Hedgehog was a really great example of this, that uh, you had this bad guy, he's turning all the cute little animals into robots. All right, go, J just go, just start the game. And th the game just starts, there's no introduction, there's no explanation of what's going on. So you just start the game. And there was the same thing with Mario and all these other games at the time. These games were made in a way that you had to have fun within the first couple of mm, seconds. Mm -hmm. You had seconds, you're immediately you're jumping, you're going like, whoa, this is immediately fun. I don't even know what I'm doing, and it's immediately fun. And I really have an immense respect for the simplicity of those games yeah. of, of back then. And the, the second thing which I really liked about those types of games, again, going back to Sonic was a good example of it, is that, well, Sonic only has a very limited range of moves. There's only so much it can do. But each level was drastically different in terms of visuals, in terms of like the paths and how fast the levels are. Suddenly you had a level that is underwater and is extremely slow because you move underwater and you have a whole different range of uh, obstacles to, 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 um, to go over, even though, even though your set of moves is still the same. So they made a tremendous job back then at keeping the game fresh with an extremely limited set of gameplay mechanics. And I have a, a tremendous admiration for that and hope to achieve some somewhat form of, of that with Bang on Ball mm -hmm. yeah, It's a big challenge from a gameplay point of view as well to try and keep it as you know clean as possible in a sense and just play with the tools that you have and let the level design change around you and suddenly things that you're very familiar with will, you know, unlock different different elements of the game for you. It's it's really cool. Yeah, for sure. And if there's a parent out there that's played maybe some of the most recent Lego games where their children, like, and again, that's another game that's really influenced us and the, 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 the co-op element where you work together and you can't really grief each other. And that's designed specifically also for parents to play with their children. Uh, all the kids can just play it by themselves. Uh, we aim for a, a Piggy 11 rating. It's just clean fun. I would definitely recommend it. I mean, you, you've, you've let your, uh, your son <laughs> play it. So. I let my three-year-old play it. <laughs> he says it's the game about the bees, but he loves it because it just smashes the button and it just dashes everywhere and everything breaks and he has a lot of fun seeing it. But one of the things which I like about our game, the Bang on Balls Chronicles, of course, is that I mean, we take a lot of creative liberties with this game, but there are some elements which are kind of true. So, uh, so I'd love, I'd love to see you know people actually going. You know, our first level that we are releasing on early access is themed around the Viking invasion of the British Isles, but there's a lot more to it than that. So we we, we put wherever possible a few details that uh, would be really cool for people to notice and uh, such as for example the presence of roman artifacts on those isles which is an actual thing actually i don't know if it matches the the timing but yeah, quite, uh, a little bit <laughs> i mean the characters are balls so you have to take liberties <laughs> but yeah the roman baths and you can explore the baths as well but that's that's a secret <laughs> right now yeah there's a few things we t you know we keep it accessible to a younger audience as well. There is a Merlin Tower in there because, you know, historically speaking, it's not super accurate, but we had to do it because it was fun <laughs> and kids will dig it. Yeah. When you start your own, your own company, your own project, it's really, really stressful. You, you believe in something and people join you and they also believe in it. And so when we see that people out there also support us by, by buying our game or by commenting, even just a thumb up on, on a video that we post, it really does mean a lot to us. It, it means it, it kind of validates that, okay, what we're doing is at least okay. And then we'll keep on you know, driving this uh, for, for, for the people supporting us, really. Yeah. I mean, for the people who are thinking about buying, th thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That's a lot. lot. And uh, I mean, again, it may, this is going to sound extremely cheesy, extremely kind of like a marketing sentence, but we, we really do believe that the only way to make a fun game is if we ourselves mm -hmm. have fun making mm -hmm. it. Like there's no way that we can make a fun game if, it, if the game isn't fun to make. 
and this game has been exceptionally great fun to make. It's been, it's a game that really doesn't take itself seriously at all. It's a game that's not trying to reinvent the wheel <laughs> in a way. Uh, and it's just clean, pure fun and we're super happy to release it to the public and for people to try it out themselves. We really, really do hope that people enjoy playing it as much as we have enjoyed making it. Okay, so the team at Exaplan consists of eight people, plus a few uh, on uh, outsource, uh, sound design, uh, music composer, who's been doing a great job, by the way. So we have a very, very small but extremely experienced team, super creative, uh, super just helpful. They, had, you know, they drive themselves, they come up with ideas themselves, everybody has an input in the game, it's super great. But it is, you know, nevertheless, it's a small team. So I'm, I'm really impressed at what we've been able to achieve, which is a small uh, amount of people. Yeah. And uh, going forward, we hope to grow st slowly but steadily and uh, keep expanding on the team and the game. So we've been doing basically for about almost a year, it was only two of us. Then up until even six months ago, it was four of us. So um, a good chunk of the game was really made by only four people. Then thankfully, uh, more people came in and really took it, took it to the next level because it's not just uh, you know the maps, but the menu is a map itself. So there's a lot of assets and so on. Um, and then, as Jose said, we've got the sound team that joined in uh, little by little. So we're still a small team. We want to keep it small because it allows us to have a lot of creative freedom and also ownership. It's really very important that each person owns. Uh, a huge chunk of the game and is able to, to be very creative within this. Um, so yeah, please be patient. <laughs> <laughs> we, do, we do have a, a plan. We have m many, many cool maps and a lot of cool things coming up. Uh, we got the roadmap, we have the team, and with the support, we'll be good. Oh, <laughs> I, I have, I'm a, I'm a stereotypical Bob, I'll change the flag every now and then, but I'm often seen with a baguette <laughs> and a croissant. Actually, the croissant is a unique item that you can only get when um, you're joining us for early access. And you'll be able to find it by finding me in the map. So when you find me, you find the croissant. So unlike Damien, I still don't have my custom-made item yet. I would like it to be a codfish, which is the Portuguese, the most famous Portuguese dish. Uh, and <laughs> num representing <laughs> number one, representing. So yeah, so so you can you can if you look in the game, you might be able to find me. I'm somewhere there, proudly displaying the Portuguese flag, and I'm also on fire, which is what I tend to make to the game. So they, they made me on fire. So uh, so yeah, but as soon as I get my 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 codfish, I'll feel like I'll feel complete. <laughs>